I'm Jim King, and I work for Adobe. I've worked for Adobe for 19 years, and Adobe had existed for six years before that, so it's a company's a lot older. I mean, it's, it's surprising some people think of Adobe as a young company, but it's uh, 25 years old. Um, I started the Advanced Technology Group, and I managed it for about half my career there, and now I work in the group for another guy named Tom Malloy. And what I've done in the last couple of years is we invented a job called PDF Architect because I've been very interested in trying to promote architecture inside Adobe to do more uh, planning and more looking further ahead and trying to structure our software to be more modular and whatnot. And we decided that we needed someone worrying about PDF. So we thought up the job and I couldn't find anybody that was both interested in language and file formats and architecture. And so finally I decided that I could do it and hire somebody to do what I was doing, promoting the architecture thing. So that's what I've done. So I've been the PDF architect for the last couple of years. I'm a computer scientist by training. So my interests are very selfish. Uh, you know, I'm promoting PDF. I'll clearly say that. <laughs> And, and uh, I, I'm not particularly an open source nut. I'm trying to understand it. I still, I've had a very hard time trying to grok, you know, how this is something that will go on into the future as a, as a real way to do things. I, I, this conference has been good. I've learned a lot and I understand it better. And I've just been involved in the standards activities recently because Adobe last January announced that we were going to turn PDF over to ISO to become a public managed standard. Adobe has written the manual since 1993 when Acrobat and PDF were first introduced. And it's always been either a published book like Addison Wesley or something or on our website. So it's always been available, but we were always the one that wrote it and made the revisions. It's up to the eighth revision now, PDF 1.7. And we decided it was time that it, the public could control it. So I'm the technical lead in turning it over to ISO. ISO submitted a ballot on July 2nd, which we'll close on December 2nd, to make it a, a standard. It's on a fast track, which is kind of a bad word these days, but I, our fast track's different. <laughs> <laughs> We're making the proper use of a fast track. See, I've, I've, written, I've got a blog I started because I thought these things were interesting. It's, it's at adobeblogs.adobe.com slash inside PDF. And I've written about six or eight things about fast tracking and Microsoft's troubles and how we're not going to have those troubles and stuff like that. Thanks. Uh, and I'm Doug Johnson from uh, from Sun. I've only <coughs> only only been with Sun for about ten or eleven years, not 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 that long. And before that, I wasn't in the computer industry at all. I was in actually contract research for uh, UVL or atmospheric science. I actually, have a PhD in astronomy. So about the origin of the universe and things like that. Yeah, you have to address us both as doctors. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not the doctors that help people. We're not that kind. Not like this morning. At any rate, at, at Sun, I spent the first four or five years in, um, in Sun Federal dealing with um, uh, primarily Department of Defense folks. So I have a, you know, I have a sort of a, one of those vague understandings of how, of how, how a very large government works. But, uh, but then uh, one of the roles that I, I took on in, in Sun Federal was actually um, standards-based acquisition, requirements-based acquisition, and, and how to feed into that you know, very long-term acquisition cycle that organizations like um, the Air Force and, and, and Defense Information Systems Agency, DISA, has uh, with the government. Very, you know, rather complex, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the way the dance goes, and you have, to, you have to see how it works. So I saw that from the inside, and then, and then um, Sun started up just six or seven years ago, a, uh, a corporate standards group, a very small group uh, of about 10 folks or so. And of course, Sun is quite large and has lots of standards folks, literally hundreds if not, if not a few thousand standards folks sprinkled throughout the company. You know, many, many people in the company will spend 10, 20, 30% of their time working on standards. These are the real experts, the folks who actually you know, are creating the technologies and doing, doing the kinds of things that, uh, that, that uh, you know, directly feed into specifications and, standardization activities. And, and our job in the corporate um, uh, uh, organization is, is first of all try to, to, to uh, provide some sort of coordination, uh, kind of a higher level coordination for that. Um, uh, there's a very interesting story about why we, one of the motivations for creating with corporate standards 
uh, group was that there was a, um, a an infamous IETF working group meeting. This was back a few years ago when the ITF meetings were 2,000, 3,000 people showing up. And there was a very large working group meeting. Two guys from across from were throwing out a camera in times about technical related issues on, on, on a subject. And it turned out they were both from Sun. And they were busy duking it out about, about the technical issues. And we said, we actually want a little more coordination than that in our, <laughs> in our public space. It was, it was a little embarrassing. You know, and from a corporate point of view, just you know, really problematic. So, so what we try to do is, is certainly not direct or anything, but rather coordinate uh, standards. Um, I work in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. So, um, as you might imagine, I got uh, uh, tangled into the uh, into the ODF issue pretty pretty early on. Um, and and from my perspective, and, and again, again, I'm not a long time computer guy, but, but a user and a user of Unix, for example, for for decades. Um, my interest here is to try to understand the dynamics of, of what's going on, not only with ODF, but with other standards-based technical innovations. And, and so, for example, in the past, um, I mean, as I, as I look at kind of things I miss, things that would make me rich and not have to work these days, I miss the internet along with everybody else. I'm looking at it, you know, I've used it at an internet address for literally 25 years, and, and not realizing that a, a relatively simple improvement like, like HTTP and HTML, right, that's, that's, that's not rocket science, that's actually pretty clever stuff. But, but that, that coupled with a browser that Andreessen built at the, at the University of Illinois um, uh, snowballed into, into many things, not just the World Wide Web. We all look at that and say, yeah, yeah, that's it. But look at what else it did it, it, in early 90s, pre-World Wide Web. When, when you set up infrastructure, right, the first thing you decided, or the second thing you decided after your platform was, what kind of network are you going to use? Are you going to use Microsoft Landworks? Are you going to use Novell Network? Are you going to use, you know, there's a, a, a IBM, token ring, there was a whole variety of networking options that you had to deal with. Uh, fast forward five years, no question at all. Things collapsed to, and, and collapsed to, interestingly enough, not the ISO standard for networking, which of course was OSI, but rather to TCP IP, something that had been around for a long time, was, was I actually think in many ways one of the, one of the original open source projects. But, but uh, it collapsed to that, and, and there was no question that, that that whole arena of competing network environments went away. And, and so, so that became an enabler for the World Wide Web when coupled with the, uh, these other things. Of course, people think the World Wide Web you know, just got in, you know, it, it took the world by storm in a very short period of time. You know, if you're used to technical uh, innovations, they often take a while to get created and, and instantiated and, and actually take hold and, in popular in popular mind, the internet and, and World Wide Web, particularly with, on the internet, did that remarkably quickly. But but like um, like our keynote speaker this morning, it, it actually built on a huge huge foundation of the ARPANET and the internet before. If that wasn't there, and we didn't have that that relatively simple ability, and, and now it's a trivial ability to connect to a computer anywhere else in the world, and have that infrastructure in place, HTTP and HTML would be useless. Right, they would, they would let let's, let you talk in a local area network. So it's that it's that you know that 25 year slog through through the internet that, that got you to the you know the early 90s that actually you know just a little bit of magic sauce on it and you end up with something like the World Wide Web, which is you know phenomenally changing things uh, in terms of you know everyday. It's 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 an intriguing. So so you know, I missed that right. I looked at that. All of us saw that and looked at it. We did realize that when you first saw the first browser, that was really clever. I remember seeing running Mosaic on, on Unix machines. I said, this is really cute. Because I dealt with FTP, anonymous FTP, Archie, Archie and Gopher beforehand. That, you know, those were sort of interesting, but a little painful periods, right? But, but it also dates me, right? It's like, you come up hard through these things. So, so you know, in that, 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 with that as kind of an example, um, uh, fast forward a bit, and now I'm looking at, at ODF, the Open Document Form. And, and trying to fathom, you know, why why that is is such a such an interesting topic. First of all, Oasis, the Oasis folks are, are really interesting. Of course, the project got started in 2002 by uh, by some folks out of Sun, and you know, it was a little tiny project. You know, half a dozen, eight folks working on it. They had you know, they had no clue that it was going to engender the the kind of attention that it does. My interest is actually understanding why it engendered that attention. Um, it's not because it's, it's tremendously you know, novel or complex technology, right? It, it's actually sort of a, an obvious thing to do, to take something that everybody uses ubiquitously, document formats, 
and make them in a in a uh, in a standardized format that you can move back and forth. I, I have to say, I, I fortunately I wasn't in the industry at this at that time, 10, 15 years ago. But I have, I have to apologize for the IT industry for not creating a, a standard document format, an interchange format earlier on. Uh, that sector of IT went from kind of one dominant market player to another. You know, went from uh, you know, WordStar, uh, WordPerfect, uh, Microsoft Word, Lotus, Lotus, of course, trying to, to get in there as a, a dominant player for a while. But it, it, you, you can see that it was, you know, that, that, that the sort of computer science principles 101 never got applied to it, right? Which is, which is you don't make your application tied, like a, like, you know, tightly to the data format. Right? You, you never do that. That's not a smart thing to do. You want those things separate so that the application, so you can use different applications. At, yeah, at the, at yeah the but to be fair, see, see, I knew it was going to be <laughs> in that time frame, those things were thought of as native file formats. They weren't thought of as exchange formats because we did not exchange electronic documents. Those were word processors that were designed to print something on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and mail the paper to somebody. And those files were private on your disk and they never went anywhere. So that wasn't a crime as much as you painted it. And, and, and the reason they didn't go anywhere <laughs> is that on, in the PC world, you didn't have the internet until the mid '90s, right? You had you had you, know, you had local, you had you had right. Your email was just your company. I, I, I have a slide from, from that I I've talked about PDF ever since the beginning. Although I haven't really anyway, I have a slide that shows a computer with a big chain and lock around it, and it says your documents are locked inside your computer. The PDF will free them. You know, so the, the frame of mind, those and, right. word was not considered to be anything you share with anybody unless they were down the hall helping you make the document in the first place. At some point, though, you wanted somebody else to see that document, and paper would be the intermediary, right? And that's where PDF yeah, came in. Exactly. <laughs> Contrary opinions? <Yeah>. Take a vote. <laughs> it, it just, it, it always seemed to be, and again, again, I'm from the Unix world. The first PC I ever touched had to be in the mid-90s. Um, I was using Unix machines prior to that, and and the the, natural, I mean, the fact that there was ASCII around to send email back and forth, you know, not not to people in your country, but or in your company, but to, to everybody else in the world, was kind of and that was really important. That was that was essential. Um, and so I think I think what we're doing is bringing different perspectives to to exactly the same issue. I see it as opportunity lost, a decade or more spent um, when when you could have. You know, when you could have actually been doing something like having created an Well, I could tell you what Microsoft should have done and what they should do, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I think we we'll actually get a chance to do that later on today, I believe. Well, let me move on. And uh, let me see. Um, and, and of course, we're actually supposed to be talking about open standards here and, and open source. So, so let me let me try to combine those a little bit. Um, uh, we had, uh, actually, I thought um, uh, Andrea DeMeo did a really nice job. You, you brought up one of the guys that, uh, that I really respect in looking at open standards, and that's Ken Kretschmer. And, and Ken um, has for, geez, more than a decade now, been kind of teasing out what it means to be an open standard. What, what I think his most valuable contribution is that, that it is classic blind man and the elephant. Um, open standards are a rather large, many-faceted subject and topic, and it's really important to understand uh, 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 the meaning of open standards in relationship to who it is that, that's looking at them. And, and so I think it's a division of the three kinds of, or three groups that, that look at open standards into creators, those who actually create the standards, those are the standards wonks, that's people who know enough to write specifications and, and, uh, and, and create the sort of the blueprint for the standard. And then implementers, right, the, the, the good developers that know how to, to take a specification and write uh, an implementation of that. And then of course, the users. And, and many, many of us simply through sheer dent of what we spend our time doing are actually in the user category. We're consumers of standards and not creators and implementers. So I was, standards are like the sausage factor. Everybody likes what comes out, but nobody likes seeing it get made. Right? And, and in, in particular, the creators and implementers, if you go to standards meetings, particularly ISO and, 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 and various TCs for Oasis and W, they're mind-numbingly boring. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry, I know. I know. <laughs> Come on, you're going to defend? <laughs> you're going to defend some of these you know, standards? One of the things I, I was thinking this morning as the speaker was speaking is that open source certainly started and it's centered around implementers. It's, sure. it's source. You're writing source code. And Eclipse is a, develop, a source 
development system. And I, I was wondering that there's a whole lot of people here from government. And, and I was going to ask, how many of these people are implementers? How many are users? Yeah. And so I think there's a little bit of a gap, at least I'm sensing it. I, like I'm new to some, certainly I'm new to a conference like this. And, and you know, I've had an outsider's interest in, in open source and things. But it strikes me that that's one of the issues and problems, is it you have a bunch of people in government that are usually just buying software. Mm -hmm. And open source says, well, yeah, you can, you can get it and download it and stuff, but you really need to install Eclipse and you need to build it because right. it's cross-platform. You can compile it for anything you want. And then you got, and also you're a developer. Well, I don't think a lot of people aren't yeah. developers. And so one of the questions, you know, how do you get started? One of the answers seems to be, well, hire a bunch of developers before you get any further. You know? and, and so I think there's a little mismatch, and maybe that would be a thing people could concentrate on. Let me, let me actually just ask, it, for, for the folks in here, you have to raise your hand once for the next three questions. Do you think you're a creator of standard, or, or I'm going to ask for each of these, but who thinks they are a creator of standards and, and would put themselves in that category? Arno, your hand is up. Another creator. Now, who, who an implementer, actually, actually knows how to get an ISO document? There we go. Um, now finally the user, that better be the balance. Okay, yes. Wow, we're, we're, we're right. and, and, and that's that's very important because once you realize you're a user, then here's what's important to you. The the, the, the things on the left here are uh, Kretschmer's cut at, um, at at the rights, you know, the things the aspects of standards that, that you're involved with. Um, or that can, you know, that, that define open standards. He has definitions for each of those. I'm not going to go into them because they're, they're, they're kind of complex. And you see, actually, users and creators are the least overlapped uh, of, of these things. Implementers, implementers are, are, you know, there's, there's a good overlap in, in sort of the interest in those rights. But, but you know, your interest is, is definitely on, on uh, you know, the bottom five or six of these, of these rights. And so that, that, that's, you know, that's what you're looking for and that's what you, that's what you, what you expect to see. Um, what what is what is really important to understand, and, and actually, I'm, I'm going to let Jim talk for a, a, a bit because he has stronger ideas on this. Is is the intersection of open source with this, and, and open source, of course. Um, uh, let me see. My this is personal uh, personal opinion, not not sound opinion or anything else. But, but I I am kind of continually disappointed with how strongly alloyed and and, and interacting open standards. Standards of any sort, open or not, and, and open sources. I, I, my personal belief is that, for example, Linux, uh, uh, the, the relationship between Unix and Linux is, is not like, oh, you know, distant cousins. I mean, these guys are almost twins. Uh, there, there's huge, huge overlap between them in terms of the Linux kernel and what it, what it implements. Yet, yet, there is a perfectly good, uh, uh, relatively expensive to participate in, but a perfectly good environment for, for certifying and, and complying to what's called POSIX. And long stories about the Unix variants and the rise of POSIX, created by NIST, by the way, the National Institute of Standards, um, in order to allow the government buy, to buy Unix by specifying a set of standards. This is, this is, I think this is, you know, if, if you don't know the past, you're, you're doomed to, to, to recreate it and to relive it. And, and my personal belief is that the Linux community is reliving a lot of the a lot of the issues, a lot of the entanglements that the Unix community did 15, 20 years ago, and and that it would you know would probably be helpful to learn a little more and actually to take some you know to take some lessons from it and, and perhaps even to wholesale take some circuit cases. I, I to this day don't really understand why um, uh, Linux distributions don't get POSIX certification. Not a single Linux distro that is POSIX certified. None of them. Um, as a matter of fact, the only three Unixes left, Unixes left that, that actually brand to Unix are Solaris, AIX, and HP Lex. And every year, Sun has to canvas mostly our federal customers and say, do you guys really still need POSIX certification? You know, is, is that brand, it's actually, it's collapsed into Unix branding uh, run by the open group. Do you still really need that? Do you want it? Because it's not free to Sun. We actually have to invest a lot in, in doing that. Manpower. Uh, licensing for test suites and things of that nature, um, and and you know we sort of get back this, yeah yeah we, we really want it right, but but then when we go around for for a uh, a competition, 
One X is right there with, with everything else, and, and you know, it doesn't have to do with the certification. As a matter of fact, now, if you want Linux, you go to LSB certification, and, and, you, get, and you get that brand. And I, you know, just, as I say, I, I'm forever confused why, why you didn't do that. Not, not that POSIX, and, and as a matter of fact, why POSIX never is, asked. Yeah, That's your mistake if you're asking. <laughs> I, I do have to admit that, that one of the problems with the POSIX world is that in the last Certainly, the fact, or no, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but my feeling is that in the last five or six years, it's not moved beyond where it was before in terms of functionality that it covers and certification and test suites. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, half a dozen, maybe eight specific test suites that handles, and we're talking you know, literally thousands of tests, uh, you know, assertions, and, and whether or not the operating system provides that to you. Uh, really, really quite, you know, it's a huge guarantee, it's a wonderful guarantee for, for, for end users. Um, and, and that hasn't been expanded beyond that in a long time. There's, there's lots of inviting. You know, as I say, this is one of the things I'm still trying to tease out and puzzle out and understand the whys and wherefores. <coughs> um, so, 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 I, so there's my disappointment that the open source community doesn't actually use open standards more. Um, well, see, these are just some of my off the off the top questions, and I'd be as much interested in your responses and answers to these. Yeah, let's see. Uh, much of the reason the open source community doesn't use open standards is because they find standards and open standards doesn't really matter as to be encumbrances, limitations. I mean, the typical argument that here is that okay, so great, you have this open standard, it's wonderful, everyone else can use it, but what happens if I come up with a better standard? Right. Which actually leads you to the eight and twenty rule. You know, if you. <laughs> If you, if you work until something's perfect, it's never going to ship. So, so you want to work until it's good enough to, to meet some needs. And, and that's actually where open source really has a strong, you know, if it's not perfect, you can jump in there and fix it yourself. I'm from the federal sector. We're working with the Chicago Transit Authority. Um, and we used, we're doing a web-based door to door um, travel information system. We used open standards, mm -hmm. open architecture. We wanted to use open source, but the search engine we needed to get it rolling within a year or two to use open source would have taken us five years more. Mm -hmm. That's our next step is to try yeah. open source. Yeah, exactly. So we do use open XML and TCIP. There's, you know, I, uh, standards, you know, there's a vibrant effort in, in, in standards. Um, and, and actually, frankly, back there at the, at the you know, stakeholders, I think the users are the ones that benefit most from open standards. It gives you competition choice and innovation. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, the second one here, do standards inhibit innovation? Yes. Jim, Jim, Jim is of the opinion that once you standardize, you know, you're, you're fixing in stone and you know, you've, you've limited or you've stopped innovation. And you slow it way down. That's the whole idea of a standard. Well, and, and the standard and, says you've got to stop changing the damn thing long enough for me to implement something that works <laughs> what it is. That's right. And if and you're so innovating, you're constantly changing everything. So they're complete opposites, the statements. Now, what you said the other day was, well, listen, I need a standard base on which to innovate on top. Exactly. I don't agree. I don't dis dispute that at all. But the base, if you standardize it, you're going to stop or slow down innovation there. Right. Adobe can crank out a new version of PDF in, in a year. The standards group's going to take two or three years to go through just the whole the, thing because enough. you're yeah. trying to satisfy more people, you have more objectives, you have more requirements. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is to stabilize it and not have it change out from under everybody. So there's, right. there's a stabilization side to standardization. <laughs> and, and I think that's really important. I think the more important is actually have to kill off competitors. If you want to really kill off innovation, take some, and, and I think he's attesting to it with, with the open source stuff. If you want to really kill off innovation, is pick something really early in its development stage and write up a spec for it and standardize it. That well, just screws you right to this really bad say, first you, idea. You want to kill off competitors, not innovation. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Innovation, <laughs> innovation is proven by what it does, not by what it's claimed. Uh, functional requirements. Yeah, well, actually, actually, the government, and, and, and again, we'll talk you know, later on today, we'll talk more about how the government gets involved with this stuff. The government has one of these unique roles uh, that when they acquire stuff, they've got to do it. They can't do it because, you know, the, the, the vendor is this person or because they, my, you know, the, the company's run by my brother-in-law or something like that. You, you, that's where the requirements requirements-based acquisition becomes really important. And it's so much easier to do requirements-based acquisition if you have standards that you can specify, standards that you can apply to, and that you have competitors within it. My, my classic example is networking in the, in the early 90s. 
right? You had you had four or five kind of roughly equivalent, right? All of them had improvements or or, or you know uh, um, you know a betterment over the other, but but it was it was not a good thing to have multiple uh, ways of doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, it inhibited uh, innovations like the World Wide Web. So so there's a technical you know there's a, always, I certainly agree with you that as a matter of fact you talk about architecting and the building the standard, I actually worry about that because I'm almost certain that, that the standard at that point is going to be, you're going to be standardizing something that's relatively immature and, and hasn't gone through a trial by a fire. That's why you know, 20 years of, of ARPANET and, and SBI and internet development was really important because it hammered out a whole lot of issues so that when you did finally collapse to it, it was, it was able to, to withstand the onslaught of, of the numbers. It was able to scale. There's a little tongue-in-cheek, but that's why we waited 14 years before we decided to turn PDF over to a standards well, body. I remember well, PostScript. We finally got it right after 14 years. How come years. you didn't do PostScript? I remember that, and I said, oh, yeah, this is perfect. This is exactly, and then I sent PostScript files to my PC friend. I said, what do I do with this? What is GhostScript, they said. So, so that was you know, the predecessor. I guess I was part of, on the learning curve. Well, there's PDF. some interesting things that we learned from PostScript yeah. that actually applied to PDF, uh, and I right. can talk about. So standardizing too early is, 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 is a problem as well. Does, does anyone, I'm going to let Jim talk now because I've chatted a lot. Does anyone want to any, make any comments on these? I don't want to open up the IPR can of worms right now. Yeah, let's wait a little for I think that is exceedingly important in, in the interaction between open source and open standards. Open source has specific requirements. Yeah. Based on what you have up there, from your perspective, mm -hmm. what are some standards needed versus open standards? Um, let me see. How are you uh, disseminating? In other words, mathematically, you have constants and variables. Mm -hmm. Standards usually provide something that's constant in whatever you're formulating, right, whether it's right. a software application or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So in what cases do you prescribe to use one versus the other? We actually slice it. There's other ways to slice as well, and that's uh, de jure standards versus de facto standards. Um, uh, Encumbered versus unencumbered standards. That's actually more like the open versus non open. Um, uh, some standards that I think some folks believe are open are actually indeed not. So, for example, uh, uh, the MPEG standards are encumbered. If, if you're actually, uh, the perfect place to find out whether or not your standard is open in the, in the non royalty, you know, in the royalty free sense, this is IPR issues, of course, is to go to, uh, the, to, to install Ubuntu and see what you can't do after you've done the basic Ubuntu installation. You can't play a DVD disc. You can't. Uh, you certainly can't play WMA files. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, uh, and these are usually focused around uh, either video or, or audio codecs because they're in comfort. They, they're standards. MP4, MP3. Those are held by. Are they ISO or ECMA? Anyway, they, they are standards, but they're encumbered. If, if I'm an implementer and I want to make a product and include that, I have to pay the owner of the standard. Um, GIF, graphics in a change format. Is, is encumbered because the intellectual property associated with the compression algorithm in GIF files is, is owned by uh, um, Fraunhofer. You know, one, one of the and things they, we often do in all this kind of stuff is we dramatically oversimplify it. And we let the, the less technical people get away with it. I mean, you, you can't jump into details every time you talk about anything. Um, but when you talk about standards, or open standards, there is, there's about six or eight properties that you might associate with them, or perhaps more, and everybody well, the makes ten, these the lists and check boxes. Yeah. But there's no one definition of what a standard is or what's an open standard. And and different groups have advocated, here's my list of requirements that make it open. And then other groups, you know, Adobe tried to coin, and I guess we still will, will try to coin the term open specification. And that would apply to what we have done for the last 14 years with PDF. That's a very, you know, and, can you go to the next slide? Because sure. is that the one? Actually, just to get back to your open standard person. Is there a listing anywhere that one could go to that would show specifically today? Lots of them. What's open and what's not? Sheesh. Um, no, because it doesn't know what to mean by open. It's a continuum of, of and, and actually what, what, as a matter of fact, what Massachusetts did, and, and you know, it's sort of front and center helping them with this stuff, they, 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 they have certain requirements, right? There's certain things they need to do. And one of them is, you know, handle documents in an editable format. The other is publish documents in an accessible format that everyone everyone can get to. And and they actually choose chose um, at that time a couple of years ago two different ways to get them, um, uh, cho choosing ODF 
as in that space, that was the most open standard they had, but in the final publishing thing, the most open standard they had was, was PDF. And they realized that those two, you know, those two are not you know, equally open in the sense of, of Kretschmer's you know, rights and, 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 and how people contribute to everything. But the pragmatic viewpoint is that you take, that, that you go to a particular design space, look at what's available there in terms of solutions. There may be nothing there at all, like, literally. Three years ago, there was nothing in the document space that was a standard, right? It was, now we have almost two. What, one and a half? We'll have two before long, I believe, my suspicion is. But, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a time value thing, and it's also a very interesting, you know, there's, there's market drivers here. There's lots of lessons I just wish I could understand them. Let me go to the next slide. Yeah. We put this together. I was hoping we have quite a bit of time that we could kind of pick different subjects and then look at these questions because this is kind of the crux of what it means. So let's look at here for a minute and then look at these things and back up a little bit. Well, who writes the standard is a question. And PDF is a very interesting example because it, it's kind of, it's been very successful and yet it doesn't follow a typical pattern. It follows an Adobe pattern that we've used with PostScript and other things. But what we did with PDF is we published, we wrote the manual inside the company ourselves with our own invention, our own arguments, our own little committee. We published it publicly the day we announced it and the day we announced Acrobat. It went out as an Addison Wesley book. It's been on our website ever since. That was 1993. So we called it open. And in, in, we also had the, the, uh, the thing of who gets it, namely who gets to use it, who gets to read it. We said anybody can read it, anybody can implement it. And who owns it? We said, well, we own the book. We didn't trademark PDF. And in the manual it says you're free to use any of the critical patents that Adobe owns that apply to making products that deal with PDF. And we've never sued anybody for doing anything with PDF. We've never gone after anybody. And that was a policy and we made it clear. So it was very, very public and very, very open, but it didn't have this requirement, who gets to write the book? We, we preserved that right. So for large purposes, you know, is that open? We kept saying, well, yeah, and everybody kept saying it's proprietary. And we said, well, depends upon what you mean by proprietary. Yeah, we get to write the manual, we get to update it, and we get to decide when a new version comes out. But there are thousands of implementers that have made things against PDF. There's billions of PDF files out there. And those files that were written in 1993 can still be read by all the software. So it's been a good specification. So, you know, you can argue, and we got it. I'll tell you one example, and I'll kind of drop the PDF thing. Last fall, you know, there's a lot of the government making regulations and things, and we, we have a European person that works for Adobe that worries about this stuff. And he got me interested in it, so he and I went and visited the Danish parliament, and we talked to several parliamentarians. They had on the books a resolution or whatever it was that was part of this ODF OOXML thing, and they had written it up to, to serve the purposes they were after, and, and we told one of the legislators, you know, we read this over, and it looks like if you go ahead with this, the Danish government won't be able to use PDF funds. The guy practically fell out of his chair. He said, really? Oh my god, I was an author of that thing. That isn't what I want. I mean, we use PDF files everywhere. We don't want to have that happen. Oh my god. He was panicked. This is the kind of thing that happens because all of this is so willy-nilly and there aren't any really good rules or anything. I'm not sure it matters, but you kind of have to look at each thing and sort of figure out what the thing is. So that that's kind of... One reason that we didn't put up a list and check boxes and things is it's kind of the Wild West. Some of the people that do put up the list and the check boxes would probably argue that, no, I've got the right list. You just choose not to look at it. But the trouble is, is there's at least five or six predominant people or, or prominent people that have such lists and they don't match up exactly. Let's take a fun one and you can, who owns it? <laughs> I said, and waved my hands a little bit, and I said I wasn't going to talk more about PDF, but it's what I know the best, about intellectual property is what the category is. And it, this is one that's kind of interesting because it's different. This is here, this is meant to be our open source row 
and this is our open standards row, or our standards row and, and implementation row, just to give us something to point at when we talk. If you talk about standards, it's who gets to implement it and what restrictions does the owner put on that person. And that's generally called IP or IPR, intellectual property. Intellectual property, as far as I know, means there's three ways to protect something you think is a brilliant idea that you, you somehow feel you want to be compensated for. One is you trade secret it. You make it a trade secret. And that means you don't tell anybody. And this is what doc, doc files were, as far as I know. They were trade secret. I don't think Microsoft ever published a spec for it. They just used it. And they didn't particularly intend for anybody to do anything with it. It was a native file format for Word to use. So, that was protecting it, I guess, if you felt it needed to protect it. I'm not sure that there was any great intent. It was just they didn't think they needed to do anything else, especially in the early days. So that was a trade secret, in, in a sense. There's probably a better example. The other one is copyright. And copyright has to do with copying things. And so you, you have to have something that you can copyright the specification book or the manual and say you can't copy this without our approval. The standards organizations copyright things, because that means that there aren't kind of bastard copies that have been reworded differently and people playing around with your document. They, they can't do that without your permission. And the last one is patents. And there's some, for specification, it's really hard to enforce it and protect it. You can copyright the manual, and you can claim you own it, but if you publish the manual, and and allow and the only way you can stop people from implementing against a specification that you've made public is to have patents that cover the technology that's needed to implement it. And that gets to be a really tough, hard thing. We made an announcement. We, we had a real dilemma. This is the kind of thing you get into with patents. I'll tell you two things that are really troublesome about patents that make it very hard to bring into this picture. Adobe has a lot of patents for a small company. We're only like 5,000 people, and, and we do have, I don't know, several hundred or more patents. We have probably 20 that are really bearing very directly on PDF, the basic ability to do PDF. We have some other ones that have to do with Photoshop and Illustrator, and maybe they touch on some fancy feature in Acrobat that you could argue, is it PDF or isn't it? Our lawyers went nuts trying to say, we want you to implement against PDF. We don't care. Here's the spec. Do whatever you want, and we won't go after you for our patents. They had a very hard time drawing that line between the ones that we were saying, fine, do these. These have to do with PDF. Implement all you want. Oh, these we really like. This makes Illustrator special or Photoshop special, or it makes a very fancy feature in Acrobat that you don't have to have special. And they tried to slice a line down there, and, and eventually all they could do is they came up with a list of patents that we owned. And we published it and said, these patents we won't ever go after anybody for if they're implementing against PDF. If they're using the patent to do a competitor one of our other products, we might. But if you're doing PDF things, fine. We want PDF to be promoted. Then what happens? People look at the list and they say, well, I'm still nervous because you may come up with another patent next week that isn't on the list. And you'll come after me with that. So the lawyers go back into a fit for another six months. You know, and we've struggled with this over and over, and we're still, I don't know what the answer is. Our current answer is we're handing it off to ISO, and we've signed a letter of agreement that we will follow all of ISO's rules, and we won't ever charge anything for anybody, for any of our patents or any of our technology for PDF if they want to, you know, use it. And we've signed this ISO, but ISO has what's called a RAND policy, reasonable and Normal, non-discriminatory. Non it says, well, I might charge you for my patents, but I'll let anybody, I won't use it to fight competition. I, I will, if somebody comes up and meets the requirements you know, of having the money and everything, they get to license it no matter who they are. And reasonable is left as that word reasonable, just meaning somehow you're not gonna try to hijack the industry. <laughs> well, that's not satisfying to a lot of people to say this, this is uh, that ISO has this policy. Now, let me tell you the, the really hard flaw in all this. 
when I first hired on at Adobe, I had a guy that was assigned to work for me that was the technical advisor to, a, to patent attorneys because we had been sued by a company for using our technology. And so I sat down with him and we went over the patent very carefully and I knew enough by then about what our technology was and we both agreed we didn't infringe that patent at all. It was done completely differently. Our postscript stuff worked way different than theirs did. And so we had our first face-to-face -face meeting and three of us, the, the patent attorney, my guy and me, went down to this company and we met with them. And they said, well, okay, we want to talk about terms of you licensing our patent. And they talked for a little while and then we said, well, we're not going to license your patent because we don't infringe it. And, and he had a very nice presentation all prepared. He went and explained, here's how Adobe's PostScript interpreter works and here's what your patent says. And they all sat there very nice and nodded and everything. And so, good, he did a great job, you know, this will be over with. And they said, okay, now let's talk about the terms of you licensing our patent. <laughs> and I kind of went, what the hell is this? Didn't these guys hear him? You know, what is this, are they dumb? And so we went through the explanation again and we argued a little bit. And he said, okay, well, that's fine, we understand that. Now, let's talk about the terms of you licensing our patent. And that's the way the day ended. And so I went back and going, this doesn't have anything to do with technology. I have no role in this. This is just a bluffing, you know, whatever. It's a business thing. And this thing went to court. <laughs> it's a business thing, yeah. This thing went to court. There was a huge trial that was very expensive, and there was a jury thing. Our technical expert made some really whizzy animations and everything, and we won. And this is his career now. In fact, he lives here in Portland. And this is what he does for Adobe. He's a PhD computer scientist, but this is what he does. He's been working with the lawyers ever since. But the point of it is, nobody can tell you whether a patent applies to something or not. They can, the wording in, the, in this RAM kind of thing says, whoever is part of the ISO process and I don't remember the qualifications, must reveal any patents that they feel have a bearing on the topic. I'm not a lawyer, so you know, don't go to the bank with any of this. But um, who knows? You never know on a patent until you're in court. You can make claims at each other. Sometimes people are reasonable. You know, like I thought these people should have coughed up right away and said, okay, we give. But they, they had to have it shoved down their throat by a, a very expensive, lengthy jury trial. And maybe they would have won. Who knows? You know, you get 12 people on jury, don't know anything for anything. And our company felt our, our technical guy that made the whizzy animations is the one that won, won the day because he made it pretty clear to the jury that how this stuff worked, you know. So the thing is, you can have all the patent rules you want. <laughs> and then what's worse, there's some patent in some obscure place that nobody's paying attention to. And ISO says, as far as we know, this, tech, this standard is, is free of license issues. All of the parties have signed RAND agreements or agreed. Somebody can just come out of the blue and say, I have a patent that this standard is violating, and go to everybody and get after them. They did it with JPEG, has had this happen. Although JPEG is not a standard standard with capital S, it's pretty widely used. And I don't think it's gone through one of the more standard groups, standard groups. But anyway, some guy came out of the, some company came out of the blue and started threatening everybody that's using JPEG, saying we have a patent that bears on JPEG. So you can only do so much about who owns it and who gets to use it. And it's better to know, at least up ahead of time, that the standards group thinks that it's open in the clear. But the patent process is particularly nasty when you go to writing code. And, and it has no bearing whether it's open source or written by a company. It doesn't matter who, who did it, under what conditions. This, the same rules apply. So this is a non-open source issue. It's just a writing programs issue, <coughs> using technology issue. And Jim, one of the interesting things is that the, that the standards bodies have vastly different intellectual property rules associated with them. And, and they've been in a lot of transition in the last few years. Uh, if you'll, if, uh, if two of the most important ones, in, in at least our opinion, are W3C, which, which shepherds the World Wide Web 
uh, uh, standards, and then OASIS, which is uh, which is uh, focuses on uh, web-based technologies and, and web services. Both of those organizations, which aren't formal, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're anti-accredited bodies, but they're not formal um, uh, ISO contributing bodies. Uh, they, uh, you know, they're they're what we call a consortia rather than um, uh, standard setting official de jure standard setting bodies. But both of those organizations have, have uh, had developed intellectual property policies that, that um, with only very, very small exceptions, um, require royalty free. When, when Jim said RAND, all the open source people have real problems with that because open source is almost always free software. It doesn't have to be, but it's almost always free software. And and if there's a you know even a dime a, a copy or, or a penny a copy, you have no you have no business model that will let you pay a, a, a you know a, a royalty license of any sort. So so one of the you know, one of the most contentious and, and biggest and most important aspects of open standards for the open source community is the one surrounding IPR. Being Rand isn't good enough. And actually, if you remember um, Crutchmer being sort of a long-time standards guy, most standards bodies have been RAND at best. You know, like people, you know, people are getting return for their intellectual property in standards bodies. Yeah. Uh, uh, the open source community won't, you know, cannot work with RAND. Uh, you get standards. into a really tough thing uh, with the standards thing, and I've seen it in the international public consortium uh, where you're standardizing it. In that case, we had all these photo photo photographic companies. Agfa and Kodak and all the people who were just super expert at film, and they knew all, had all kinds of secret sauce and tons of patents. And so we got in and we started writing up the specification for, for color profiles and stuff like that. And they go, well, we have a patent, you know. And so we got to the point where we either had to make a choice where we would have this organization be successful and have to face that people might have to pay somebody a royalty for a patent mm -hmm. or license it, or just abandon the, the goal of the organization and just throw up your hands and not do it. And so a lot of standards organizations are just faced with this dilemma. We want to go forward with this standard, but there's this patent issue in the way, and they try to get it resolved best they can, and if they can't, then they change their rules or they have rules and say, well, we can live with that as long as it's RAND, you know, reasonable and non-discriminatory. You know, what more could you ask for? And a lot of companies will, will put up with it. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of people who hate the patent system altogether and think we should have banner. And even the notion of uh, um, whether or not one can patent the software itself. Um, uh, in the US, you can. In Europe, um, they are. Yeah. They're dealing with the question about that. Just for fun, I'll tell you another trick, another thing. And this, this is OK. I have to be careful. I know so much about Adobe. Um, we had. We have, we have a big business in selling fonts. You, you, can, you can't copyright a, a font exactly. It's, you know. Anyway, they, we had a hard time trying to protect people from copying and stealing them. In Europe, they have design patents that you can patent the design of a font set. And okay. In the US, we didn't have anything. So the same guy that to this, that's become this lawyer's technical assistant, we figured out that our fonts are actually programs. They're PostScript programs, the ones that the type 1 fonts and, and, and true type fonts and things are. They're programs. So we copyrighted them as programs. And we could protect our fonts and go after people for copyright. And that was a boon to us because it let us have good typographers and design really nice, fancy fonts and own a, a really good, useful library and get some benefit from it, as opposed to having no way to protect people from ripping them off. There's still a lot of you know copying and stuff, and there's tools to clone them and everything. But it helped our business and helped people get better fonts because we could fund a business that at least made some money. But it's a funny thing. I mean, we found a way mm -hmm. to use one of the means to, to right. protect something that you normally wouldn't be able to protect by calling them fonts. So all of our literature, you'll find they talk about font programs and not font files. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, of the, one of the ways that, um, uh, that the industry has moved towards uh, <coughs> trying to address some of these intellectual property issues surrounding standards is um, uh, that, that uh, there's a, a, legal, a legal statement called the Covenant Not to Sue. Um, and, and Sun has issued one for ODF in particular, 
Uh, we're actually reviewing a lot of other things to issue them for. It, 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 it removes all of the, the, the concerns that Jim had where you, know, you don't know what patents you might have or what might in, in, you know, impact a particular technology. And so, and so you simply make a blanket statement. He says, yeah. you don't even say that you have anything, but if you do have anything that, that bears on this, um, you, you, you promise that you will never sue surrounding surrounding this this particular yeah, that's what we've done. And, yeah. and it turns out that it's quite you know it, it turns out that it's quite useful because it it, 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 it reaches a bar that allows uh, open source implementations, right, realizing that there won't be RAND issues following up, um, in areas that you know have have intellectual property encumbrances. But uh, it right. doesn't say that say Microsoft or somebody might have a patent that bears on ODF and come so, out of the woodworks. So and, IBM and, yeah. and Microsoft's current discussions are, are you know, saber rattling about Linux. Um, yeah. it, it is, you know, these are these are important <coughs> issues that that have yet to resolve. As a matter of fact, as as Jim noted, they'll resolve when somebody gets sued, gets dragged into court, and you get a you get a precedent. It's a very expensive way to do it. These things are, you know, these these are floods and, and you know, impinging on the the the, the, the robustness of viability. It's a, it, it decreases the comfort level when you know, who was it that actually got in? What uh, the the um, AutoZone, where the guy is using Linux, right? The end user, the, the sacrificial end user getting hauled into court for using Linux. That, that, you know, that doesn't make anybody feel good. And, and you really want to, you know, uh, trying to address those things is, is complicated and, and is complex and is an ongoing process. So we have a little over five minutes. We probably should do what you guys want to do if you have questions. We didn't talk much about open source on here. And I wanted to because I think you guys know more about open source than we do by at least certainly by me. I made it move. Yeah, this was this is what uh, this is what they asked us to do, and we didn't do. It was a good idea, and it was a nice idea. Well, I hope I hope you that folks have found this to be at least at least useful. So questions, comments. I wanted to plug architecture. So if I mean I could fill up time. There aren't any burning questions. Now, there's a threat for you. <laughs> anyway, a question. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. What did you expect that we might tell you that we haven't talked about yet? Or did you have no expectations? <laughs> did you say low or no expectations? <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and say what I wanted to say. You know, for, for standards, we're over here talking about creating a specification. And for open source, we're talking about here of developing software. But what strikes me about all these conversations about standards and open source is they kind of jump into the middle. I view a specification as documenting some kind of an interface. And I include a file format as, as an interface. It's saying, here's something we'll all do the same way. And you can come at it from this way. You can write a file, or you can read a file, or you can make a call, or you can implement a call. And it will be an agreement where we can hook modular pieces of software together. When we talk about modular software and interfaces, then you say, well, who dreams up where those interfaces go and exactly what, how the system is modularized? And that's architecture. So inherent in writing specifications is, is either somebody has already sketched out an architecture and you've picked a particular interface inside that architecture to write down and specify so that interchange can take place and we can do plug and play, or you have to do the architecture. Now, I particularly think architecture is not a committee activity. It's, it's more structured than that, and you, know, you don't vote on architecture. And, and I, I apply this to the, to the open source, because I think the most successful open source projects, as far as I've been able to understand, have a really strong person that is a key architect and makes really critical decisions and kind of lays out the structure. Either that, or some company donates a bunch of software that already has an architecture and already has a bunch of interfaces, and then you work within that. But you know, I, I would like to see a lot more talk and effort, and, and I'm thinking of government agencies like a lot of the audience here. If <laughs> you can't just buy a piece of software and go, oh good, you have to have an architecture of you know, whole design of who's the users, what's the system, and what hardware we're we going to get. And there's a gazillion issues, and, and the little piece of software that drops into this whole thing is a tiny part of it. Or what standard you use for HTTP or something, you know, that's just a tiny part of putting a system together and delivering services to your citizens. So, and I, I presume there are 
symposiums and meetings and stuff where we talk about architecture, but I, I just find it strange that we talk about standards and open source when they're kind of not the starting point. And I, I never heard the word architecture in the, the day and a half I've been here. Hmm. Never. Yeah. And I'm going, I don't know. And standards groups don't talk about it too much. I guess there are some standards. The other thing I believe is that if you say, I'm going to write a spec for how something works, and you write it all down, and you hash it out, and argue, and you get it, everyone agrees. And then you try to implement it, you'll find out you make tons of mistakes. When you go to implement it, you go, no, oh, we got that all wrong, didn't we? And you've got to go and back and start Adobe. over. That may be an Adobe, son. son. <laughs> oh, it's clean, first time. <laughs> you just have to take out the F word. So I think <laughs> you have to do, all of these are kind of cycles, you know. And I knew there's a huge cycle here. And I even will accept that a company like Adobe can put a product out and sell it to learn whether they got the system modularized at the right place and have the right interface and then standardize it later. That you need to allow to get it right before you standardize it too soon. So I think you actually gave the answer to your own question by saying that it's just too hard to do in a committee. And when you look at how things go, basically, I mean, there are some examples. Like at the Direct3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, they didn't tackle architecture for years. The web kind of you know, evolved with a different specification of HTML, HTTP, and other fundamental pieces of, of the web technologies. And it's only after several years that they actually created the architecture group, which is actually not completely democratic because it's, I mean, it's an elected board with different uh, uh, experts from the industries that are elected. Uh, and it is chaired by Tim Berners-Lee, who is the so-called inventor of the web. And he probably you know, has a very strong uh, view on how the whole thing should you know, work. But I strongly believe that if we had tried to do it the other way around, which is a more traditional you know, uh, approach you would have in a corporation typically, it just wouldn't happen. And in fact, there are examples of that. For web services, and you know, I'm part of IBM for people who don't know me, and uh, we actually initiated a working group in W3C called the Web Services Architecture Group. And it was a disaster. It just didn't work. Because everybody has its own view of what the architecture should be. And it's just not a practical way of making progress. So once you accept that, then what is the next best thing you can do? And what we found is, well, we can agree on some things. And this is already a step forward, so let's do those. And what happens is that you develop these specifications somewhat in isolation, everybody having some kind of its own view of how the different pieces should fit together. And yes, at some point in time, they don't always fit, or you know, there is some problem that show that you did not anticipate because you had a different interpretation of how the pieces fit together. And then you have to revise some pieces. Some pieces just are abandoned, others are created. But I think it's just a practical way of making progress. Sounds good. Uh, I agree with it. It's more like an evolution. I mean, what you said about how hard it is and everything is what I think about with committees. You know, I, I've been to architect on various projects, and I remember lots of times when someone would, new would come in and they start talking to me about it, and I go, all right, here's what we're going to do. And we talked about all those ideas before you came, and we rejected most of those, and we're not going to do them. And you really, you know, to do good architect, it's almost more important to say what you're not going to do than to say what you are going to do. And if you don't do that right, and you don't have, it's usually a single person. If you don't have a person that says, here's what we're going to do, and here's what we're not going to do, you have this committee effect saying, well, we could extend the requirements. Yeah, that would be great if we could do that too. And so you put this extra thing in. And I was telling this gentleman earlier in the day with the color stuff, you know, the standard computer science things, if you have M things here and N things here and they have to all interoperate, you put a dot in the middle. This is what we do with measurement systems, you know. You, you can say, well, we'll define everything in terms of meters. And so no matter what your measurement system is, you just go look up the meters and you look up the other one with the meters and you can do the conversion. So there's a standard technique, you put one dot in the middle and say everybody defines their thing in terms of that and then we know how to convert from one to the other. The ICC, what do they do? They put two dots in the middle. They go to their degree. You know, one company was using LAB, another company was using XYZ. 
And we finally just said, oh, hello, we'll put two dots in there. So you now you go in one dot, and you have to translate to the other dot and go out to, you know, it's kind of messy. But that's what you get in architecture that a committee does. You get too many dots. Uh, so that's the difference between RGB and, and uh, the color hue system? No, no, no. It's more complicated. Not? I have a tutorial on my website. <laughs> you could, uh, well, listen, I think if there's no more questions, we should probably let you go. You've been very attentive. We should thank you. Thanks for coming.